Welcome back, everybody. Please come on in, take your seats. You're very welcome. I'm Dr. Robert Dupont, and uh, I'm proud to say that I am your moderator. At least that's the way I read the program. Not hearing any objection, I'm going to proceed on that assumption. Uh, our topic this afternoon is drug effects on the adolescent brain, preventing youth drug use is a global imperative. Now, that is a very serious statement. I'm going to just uh, focus on it for a moment. Uh, we're talking about the uh, brain and drug use, and we're particularly focusing on the adolescent, and then we're saying this is uh, an imperative for, uh, for uh, drug policy. Now, I mentioned yesterday that, uh, that as the first director of NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Use, uh, NIDA now invests more than a billion dollars a year in drug use research. NIDA is now uh, 38 years old, uh, and uh, the single greatest achievement of NIDA in that period of time has been the understanding of the brain mechanism why drug use occurs and what the effects on the brain are of drug use. Our speaker today, and we have one speaker, this is a very unusual setup here, is Bertha McGrath. Uh, Bertha is professor uh, of psychobiology at Harvard Medical School, which is the medical school I graduated from. Uh, and she is uh, the leading, or one of the leading uh, researchers, and, and, and brain researchers in the world. And, and Bertha is very unlike most researchers uh, in that she's uh, focused on the use of the knowledge for public health purposes. And in that context became the head of demand reduction, that is everything to do with research, prevention, and treatment, uh, in the White House office, uh, a post that she held with, uh, with great distinction uh, and had a, a, a profound effect in a number of areas, which I hope maybe she's got some time to talk to you about, uh, in, including uh, student drug testing uh, and uh, re-screening and intervention, where she has really been the, uh, the, the pioneer of the leader. Well, we're in, in for a great treat. Bertha is going to talk to you uh, until she's finished her last slide and had her last statement. And at that point, she and I are going to be a tag team to discuss with you uh, what you want to talk about and what your observations you are in question and answer uh, for, this, uh, for this hour and a half. So we're in for a great treat, and let me introduce you, uh, Professor Dr. Bertha Madras, leading brain researcher who's going to focus on the adolescent brain and the importance of this knowledge, this biological knowledge, for prevention and all we're working on. Bertha? Dear Bob, thank you so much for those kind words. Um, all not true. <laughs> this is quite a provocative um, title, that this is a global imperative. And the reason I decided to be provocative, because I'm usually quite cautious about making statements, is that the evidence is beginning to mount, and mount, and mount, that young people are much more susceptible to drugs than older people. And the evidence is coming from human studies. The evidence is coming from animal studies. And you look at me and say, what can rats teach us that humans cannot? What can primates teach us? What can mice teach us? They can teach us an awful lot for a very simple reason, that every human study has confounds, has problems associated with it. The confounds are, for example, let us say that children use drugs not because the drugs are rewarding, but because they have psychiatric problems, they have genetic problems, they have environmental problems, they are subject to um, abuse at home, 
They have personality disorders that drive them to drugs. They have all these confounds. I can go on and on. They may not self-report the actual drugs they use because it's not ethical to give a child a drug and then test their brain or test their function. So you have, you have tremendous restraints in trying to understand, is the adolescent brain unique or is it a problem of their environment, their personality, their genetics, and it has nothing to do whatsoever with the impact of the drug on their brain. So the way to circumvent that is to compare the effects of drugs in adolescent mice or rats or primates and see whether or not they respond differently. And these animals that we use for this purpose have no confounds. They're not hungry. They're not being sexually abused. They don't have a genetic background. They're not failing at school. They don't have a personality disorder with their peers. Their parents are not neglecting them. They're all treated the same way. So that in a way, if you use a preclinical model, which is an animal model, you can begin to confirm what you observe with children or begin to gain insights in ways that is, at this point it's completely impossible to do with human studies. And right at the end of my presentation, I'm going to give you a few just a few pieces of data from my own lab, which are as close to hot off the press as possible, because they were just generated and analyzed a few weeks ago, that compare the effects of two different types of drugs on adolescent mice and on adult mice with regard to some very key molecules in the brain. So that's by way of introduction. A great deal of the focus of my talk is going to be marijuana. I said earlier in my comments that adolescents are much, much more susceptible to addiction, to alcohol, to nicotine, to cocaine, to opioids, to marijuana, to anxiolytics, to inhalants, all the drugs, every single addictive drug that is taken by an adolescent, and I left out ecstasy, but that is, is true as well, they have a much higher prevalence of being addicted when they grow up than if they started to use at age 18 or older. And we're going to try to explore some of the possible reasons for this. So here are the topics. We will begin with the developing brain, the developing adolescent brain, marijuana and the developing adolescent brain, and other drugs. And I would like to highlight to you that one of the reasons I became very interested in this topic, because it was never part of my research until quite recently, I was more interested in trying to understand the mechanisms of how drugs change the brain but as I worked in Washington for years and began to realize the devastation that is felt by young kids who are in residential treatment programs and can't even go to school, and their parents are devastated. There was one moment when a Hispanic woman who didn't speak a word of English, but was desperate, desperate to get her child into treatment because her 13-year-old daughter was addicted to heroin, inhaled heroin in Dallas, Texas. And she came up to me and literally wrapped herself around my arm and clawed at my skin, begging me not to leave until I found her a place, a placement for her child. And I didn't speak Spanish, so I asked an interpreter to tell her that I was going to go from that uh, forum straight to the main adolescent treatment center in Dallas and find out why there wasn't a slot for her child, which I did. 
I won't tell you what I found because I don't want to discourage people in the audience. They had plenty of places. It was all bureaucracy that prevented this poor mother and this poor child from getting the kind of treatment that could have helped them. And what we see on high school campuses, what we see in neighborhoods are people and in the legitimate drug industry, the alcohol and the tobacco industry, there is an absolute awareness, trust me, there is an awareness that if you hook kids, you've got them. And it's much easier to get them than to get the adults. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean for a moment that if you start using drugs as an adult, nothing will happen. Of course there is an addiction potential when drug use is initiated while you're an adult. But it does mean that if you start as a child, it is much, much more readily, um, it's a much more ready outcome. And for alcohol, every year that you delay initiation of use, you reduce the chances by 15%. It's a remarkable, and it was a wonderful study that was done in the mid-1990s that still has not been refuted. So, there is something different in the adolescent. And we'll try to narrow down some of these qualities and features of the adolescent and see whether or not we can begin to understand if it's the drug itself or the interaction of a drug with a specific child that has a specific vulnerability. How many of you in this room are aware of what happens during brain development? It is the most remarkable thing. It is the most wondrous orchestration of events, I think, in all of biology. Only, perhaps, the only competition is the immune system. But think about it this way. We start with one cell in a human embryo. And from that single cell, we begin to create nerve cells of different shapes, of different sizes. And if you look closely, you can see unequivocally that they have many connections. Some have only one connection, some have five, some have 20. They branch out like trees, like plants. The purpose of all these different shapes and sizes and connections is that the brain is the master communicator in fact, the master communicator of the universe, Bill Gates, is still very envious of our brains. This is one area he can't quite penetrate yet. He can compute faster than we can, but he certainly can't produce a machine that thinks better than we can. So how does this happen? How do these neurons assemble, these nerve cells? And if you think about this orchestrated event, you take one cell and it has to communicate with another and another and it has to line up very carefully until eventually you communicate over 100 billion of them. There are 100 billion cells in your brain that talk to each other, talk to the rest of the body and talk to the universe around you. And think of the myriad of things that they do. They enable you to see, to hear, to taste, to feel, to touch, to be hungry, to be thirsty, to void, to speed up your heart rate when you're excited or concerned or stressed, to think, to compute, to create these wonderful, miraculous things that is the repository of our humanity. It is our brain. And somehow, in the course of this little developing fetus, 
A hundred billion cells are wiring in a perfect dance so that they can enable a living body to survive for a lifetime. And of course, sometimes the wiring is not perfect. But even more fundamental than this, before we even understand this, we have to step one step backwards and ask ourselves a very simple question. What is communication among nerve cells? Where did it begin? Why did it begin? And when you think about it, communication is the heart and soul of all life that is more than a single cell. And even single cells talk to each other. The lowly amoeba that is a microscopic level, there's some forms that live in soil. And when they run out of food, they send out chemical messages and they say, come hither. And they all gather and they form a big blob and they move towards a food source and then they set off spores and seed themselves so they make more of themselves. And bacteria, when they come near danger, bacteria are much, much smaller than amoeba. And when they come near danger, they also send out chemical signals that warn the others, either there's danger here or there's food. And the oak tree, when it's attacked, the oak tree, when it is attacked, by insects will send out chemical messages and the adjacent oak trees will pick up those messages, interpret them and create insecticides within them to start to resist the invasion and the attack. I mean, it's miraculous how life evolved to be able to communicate. Now, what is the heart and soul of the communication system? It is these long wires in the days when we used to have wire telephones. You just think about it. We would send a message through a wire. The message would be a sound and somebody would receive it and interpret it. In the brain, the message is a, is a chemical. And that chemical goes from one nerve cell to another until it enables me to talk and to gesture with my hands. It enables you to hear, to listen, to move, to scratch, to fall asleep if you wish. But that is the beauty to this. And each one of these nerve cells has up to 20,000 connections. I showed you the diagram of these, they're called dendritic trees. They can reach out and touch people they love, neurons they love, and they want to communicate with. Now, in tandem, in, in parallel with this communication, there is also the need for blood supply. And what's interesting is that the nerves begin to grow, the blood supply grows along with it. And they use some of the similar messages to wire themselves up. And underneath supporting these 100 billion miraculous little tiny units, these little computer chips are a trillion supporting cells that do even more jobs. They do some of the, perhaps one can view it as the dirty work, they clean up some of the metabolites, but they also engage very heavily in brain communication. So this is a remarkable system. It is so remarkable that it has inspired awe amongst people who work in this field. But there is a concept about development that is possibly a little bit unknown to you, and perhaps it is known. How many of you think that brain development ends at around the age of 10? Or 20? Or 25? Well, it does continue. It continues very steadily. And how do you know that? You don't have to look inside a brain to understand that. 
all you have to do is look at a little child who learns to crawl and then to walk and then to speak and then to control their bodily functions and then to begin to make demands and then to begin to develop a personality. And then in, during teenagehood, you notice a whole other range of changes. Socialization, the beginnings of executive function, that means long-term planning processes. The beginnings of maturation of secondary sexual characteristics. All these changes are happening. And we know with absolute certainty now that the adolescent brain is undergoing phenomenally rapid development. And you say to yourself, okay, so how do all these wires hook up? Well, we'll try to show you in a few minutes. But there are different regions of the brain that wire up at different times. The prefrontal cortex, just touch yourself right now on your forehead, right between the eyes. That's the part of your brain that is your executive function piece. That tells you whether or not you should control your behavior, your long-term planning. It tells you whether or not you're exercising good judgment and making decisions. And that matures very slowly. And basically what happens in the transition from the adolescent to the adult is that your control over your impulses and your desires become more and more contained so that you're not likely to take a bike ride in the middle of a rainstorm. You're, not, you're less likely to spend the night playing video games if you have an exam the next morning. You're beginning to think of the future and planning towards it. And the largest maturation in the frontal lobes happens between 12 and 16. So, the first principle is that the adolescent brain is not fully developed. The second principle is, and the only reason I introduce this, and please don't fall asleep now, but I introduce this because these are the proteins we're studying currently. There are four classes of phenomenal and weird and interesting proteins made by your brain and their job is to tell the wires, come hither, go that way, turn around, go up to this part of the brain, stop here, don't connect or do connect. And they are the keys to development because they're the ones that tell the brain how the wiring diagram is going to go. So there are ephrines and nephrines and semaphorins and slits and robos and DCC, all of these. And I will just in the very end show you some of the data we have on these particular molecules. But they're very complex, there are multiple numbers of them, there are hundreds of them that tell the brain how to go and they also guide the blood vessel supply during that time. And in the adult brain, they're very important for learning, for memory, for developing new nerve cells, for repair and injury. In fact, one of the reasons that you cannot really repair a spinal cord injury or a brain injury the way you can an injury in your fingertips is because these guys are produced and they tell the nerve endings stop, don't go any further. Instead of telling them please continue and grow back to your, to your destination. And that is a problem that is being looked at in terms of trying to solve how to repair the brain. So in infants, brain growth is essentially to develop volume, to make it big. You know, that when, when a child is born, their head is so much bigger proportionately to their body. 
but it keeps growing and expanding. And, and essentially what the brain is doing is creating these hundred billion nerve cells during infancy and childhood. And then, so the brain grows and grows, and then from childhood to adolescence, there's another process that happens, and that is to cut back. Because it's made a huge, it's like planting a garden and throwing a million seeds on the ground. And you have this vast array of branches and roots and trees and leaves. And then you say, this thing is a mess. I want to make it neat and tidy and aesthetic and efficient. So during adolescence, the brain begins to prune back and prune back. And it cuts a lot of connections that are not needed. And it strengthens the ones that are needed. So that eventually you cut back and that you'll see in some, some of the images that have been developed by folks at NIH and at McLean Hospital, you see that the brain, the gray matter, is actually getting smaller, not because the number of cells are disappearing, but the number of connections are getting very efficient and they're, and they're, they're dying, and the ones that are not needed. So the ones that are important for survival are selected out, and they're preserved into the adult brain. The connections that are not used just vanish during adolescence. So here are these pseudo-color images. They're computer generated, but the gray matter is red and orange. The blue matter is white matter. And what you can see from the age of 5 until 10, 15, and 20 is that there's pruning and pruning and pruning. So there's very profound changes that occur during this period between 10 and 20 years, and the brain continues to develop even until the, the, uh, the child is, is 25. I call them child because my children will be children until um, they're in their 80s. <laughs> That's how I perceive it. <clears throat> now, in addition to these changes in brain structure, there's very important changes in brain function. And here is the most graphic way to demonstrate it. Here in this little green area that I can wheel around is in a region called the amygdala. The amygdala regulates emotions, anger, rage, stress. It lowers your sensitivity to risk. It's part of your sensation-seeking and novelty-seeking part of the brain. It is really the heart and soul of your emotional life. And it is, if you give a teenager an emotional scene, that amygdala lights up very robustly. And the frontal cortex, the area that's involved in judgment and behavior control, barely, barely, is activated during this emotional scene. You give an adult the exact same picture, and what you find is that the frontal cortex, the reasoning part of the brain, the part of the brain that's involved in regulating and judgment and reasoning, problem solving, and impulse control, that part of the brain is very active when you give an adult an emotional uh, scenario and the amygdala, the emotional part, is almost silent. So what does this say? It says the poor adolescent, who is verbally ten times better than me. I mean, my my children, the, we, they were growing up. They could talk rings around me. They were verbally more competent. They were. Um, in athletics, far more competent than me. In every possible way, it's in, in, in certain forms of calculus and advanced math, I was dazzled. But, in terms of judgment, no. And that's where parenting was very important, to try to bring a sense of judgment and perspective on a, an adolescent brain that sounds as verbal adept as you are, but is definitely not a grown-up brain. So, this is a problem, because what occurs 
and this is something that is quite uh, astonishing with regard to uh, neurodevelopment. Most developmental disorders happen during adolescence. Impulse control disorders, substance abuse disorders, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, and schizophrenia. They emerge during the developing adolescent brain. What does that tell you? That really tells you that it is a very fragile period in brain development. And a very critical one. Because this is when the wiring diagram goes wrong. Something happens during adolescence. You don't really see robust schizophrenia or substance use in young children or impulse control disorders. You don't see mood disorders as frequently. You see them in adolescence because it is likely that the brain is wiring up very, very differently during that period of time. And the mistakes in wiring can occur. And that's a fragile time during brain development. So we have already mentioned that addiction is a major concern for the adolescent brain because so many drugs are more addictive in the adolescent than in the adult. And the big challenge is, is it because the brain is fragile and developing, or is it because of all these other confounding factors that I've mentioned? Is it because there are innate differences in adolescence, predisposing factors, psychiatric or environmental, or is it because the child is going to be addicted because they've been using the drug longer, so the prevalence rates are higher? Or are the neurotoxic effects of drugs specific during adolescence? Or is it drug use because the drug effects are, are, are robust in adolescents who are not interested in academics? Or is it because the brain is much more susceptible to being miswired during that critical time? So concept Number one, again, the adolescent brain is not fully developed. Let's take a look at some of the information on marijuana and the developing adolescent brain. And we're going to go on a journey with marijuana through the brain. We're going to look at smoke, biology, brain distribution, marijuana actions, addiction, and other short and long-term consequences. Marijuana is not a pure product. It contains, it used to be about 60 cannabinoids, the latest number is about 80. The ammonia in marijuana smoke is up to 20 times greater than tobacco smoke. And there's also hydrogen cyanide and nitric oxide and aromatic amines that are three to five times higher than those found in tobacco smoke. And it does contain known carcinogens and other chemicals that are implicated in respiratory disease. Now, we can actually map where marijuana goes in the brain. If you give a person um, a, a THC and better some synthetic cannabinoid that has um, the better properties, you can make it radioactive. You can label it and detect where the radioactivity goes and see where it goes in the human brain. And these are brain images. These are not, uh, they're pseudo-colored, but they are not just drawings. This is a PET scan of marijuana distribution. This is an MRI showing the, um, the structure of the human brain. And this is a real subject. And this is the overlay of the two to identify those areas. Every time I mention studies, please note these are not my own. These are authored by other people, but I've collated as much as possible from the field in order to try to develop a coherent whole. There is no way on earth one individual can do even a fraction of the studies that have been done in this area. Now, there's a real question that arises from this distribution, and that is, Marijuana doesn't go all over the brain. 
it does not. It settles in certain areas, and it doesn't settle in others. Does anybody know why? Any guesses? And anyone in this room who's familiar with the field would tell you immediately that a marijuana experience is not a heroin experience, is not an LSD experience, is not a cocaine experience, is not an alcohol. They all do different things to your brain. They all have very different psychoactive effects. Would you agree to that? Yes. So, the clue as to why marijuana produces its spectrum of effects lies in its brain distribution. And the brain distribution lies in the fact that the chemical that's in marijuana smoke, the main chemical is delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, looks like a chemical produced by your own brain. How fascinating. Your brain produces a cannabinoid? Yes, it does. Your brain produces serotonin, which has structural similarities to LSD. Your brain produces dopamine, which resembles methamphetamine. Your brain produces blue and methamphetamine and beta endorphin, which has structural overlap with heroin and morphine. Your brain produces chemicals that are the chemical messages that I spoke about earlier. And the drugs resemble those chemical messages. Now what's the first conclusion you would draw from that? It's so, so very obvious the minute I say it. And the only way we'll get to it is I'm going to ask everyone to look at the person on your right and communicate with them. Tell them to stand up verbally. Stand up, tell them to stand up. And stand up, let's get a postprandial little exercise. And now sit down. And now tell everyone on your right to stand up, but don't say a word. Use any other gesture. Let's, let's get a little bit of exercise. Wonderful. Thank you. Now sit down. Now look at the person on your right and tell them to stand up, but uh-uh. No words, no gestures, because the nerve cells can't speak words and they can they don't have little hands. Can you do it? No, you can't. And if you do, there's something wrong. <laughs> and the reason is that without, without speech, and without written words, and without hand gestures, the brain is using chemical messages to send signals. It's sending signals so that I can speak. It's sending signals so that you can see. And these signals resemble the drugs. The structure, the chemistry is similar to the drugs. So what does that tell you instantly? The drugs are invading the brain's communication system. They insert themselves right into the communication system, and by doing so, they affect brain function. They affect perception. They affect your feelings, your moods, what you see, what you hear, what you think, what you feel, what you do, because they are interfering with normal communication. Now, normal community, so I've heard from people who really appreciate drugs and don't like anti-drug messages. The brain is making these things, the drugs look like them, and they say, what's wrong with that? After all, they just look like your own brain's communication system. And I say, aha, now here is the difference, and there is a gigantic difference. The difference is that I am speaking to you and if I didn't have a system to get rid of a chemical message, I could not finish my sentence. 
because the messages are squirted out in milliseconds, thousands of seconds, and the minute they're squirted out, they're removed so that I can go on to the next sentence. So instead of waving like this, I can wave like this. Now, the brain can do this in the most exquisite way because we are geared to sending out a message in a thousandth of a second time frame, removing it, putting it back to where it began, and getting ready for the next signal. We have to adapt instantaneously to everything around us. But the brain cannot do that with the drug. The drug binds tightly to the communication system. The, the brain has a transport truck that trucks away the messages. The drug doesn't fit the transport truck. And so the signal is loud. It's exaggerated. It is huge. It is different. And it's everywhere in the brain. It's not only where our little messages are being squirted out. It's all over the place at amounts that are not at all controlled. We control the amounts that we squirt out exquisitely. They're called little quantum packets. They're stored in little tiny little balloons and they're released in very definite amounts. But the drug comes in and just washes the brain with signals and you can't wash it away. So the sensations can last for 30 minutes, an hour. With amphetamine it can last three to six hours and marijuana can hang around for a week and interfere with communication. That's the heart of it. That's the heart of it. Because once the brain gets this phenomenal, phenomenal noise, what does the brain do to respond to it? What, how is it going to deal with it? The way it deals with it is adapting. It says, oh my Lord, I'm getting so many signals. I'm going to dampen down the whole system. I'm going to lower the volume because the volume is too loud. But once it lowers the volume, it lowers it very low because the signal is too strong. And then what happens? You take away the drug, the volume is very low, and you don't feel right any longer. Because the drug is gone, the volume is down, and you can't hear anymore. You can't feel good anymore. So the brain begins to adapt and adapt to that sledgehammering of signals, that almost, almost like a, a concrete buster. And, you know, it's, it's a remarkable process of adaptation. So, let's continue. The distribution of LSD, the distribution of marijuana, very different. Why does um, opioids, why do they, can they kill you and marijuana can't? Because in the brainstem, they're opioid receptors that regulate heart rate and breathing. And in the brainstem, there are no, there are no um, receptors, there are no interpreters of the cannabinoid signal. And that's why one doesn't die of an overdose. So, just to summarize, brain communication is analogous to human communication. There's a transmitter, a message, and the ear is your receiver. And the same way that one nerve cell talks to another, it squirts out these little chemical messages and the receiver picks them up, just like speaking, just like communicating. The cannabinoid system is actually very unique. You know, we hear of can cannabis in medicine, immune system, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, pain sensations, uh, learning and memory. We hear of a myriad of things that cannab cannabinoids may do. And when you look at the biology, you say that's quite, quite an array of functions. Why? 
the cannabinoid system is the most densely, densely populated communication system in the brain. And the brain's own cannabinoids do something that many other chemical messages do not. They control the release of other chemical messages. They float up to the nerve cell and they tell the nerve cell, don't make any more, don't squirt out any more, dopamine, glutamate, and so on. So, GABA, glutamate, acetylcholine, serotonin, they control the release of many of the chemical messages. That is actually quite alarming. Because when you put an artificial chemical into that system, and you have the opportunity to affect and influence so many, of, so many brain functions, you begin to wonder what are the long-term consequences, and we'll describe these in a moment. There are two types of receivers, interpreters of the message. The CB1 that is found primarily in the brain, it's found in heart and testis and uterus and prostate, vascular tissue, immune cells. And all of these are listed not to bore you and put you to sleep, but to try to help explain why marijuana can have such very significant effects on so many parts of the body. The CB2 receptor, which the active ingredient of marijuana is very weak, is found primarily in the immune system. So, let's summarize where we stand with biology. The brain expresses cannabinoid receptors. These are the interpreters, and they have many functions. Marijuana contains THC, which resembles but differs from the ones. It invades the signaling system, and it changes normal signaling. And we're only beginning to understand the full array of what this means. So what is the cannabinoid sig signaling involved with? Appetite, pain, learning, memory, early pregnancy, implantation, fertility, and sucking, and nerve terminals, and opioid addiction. And the CB2 is involved in a whole other array of functions. So when one takes marijuana, what are the acute effects? Mood elevation, increased laughter, enhanced hearing, enhanced sensory input, euphoria, hunger, relaxation. That is what most people self-report. It also impairs memory, attention, and a host of other things. Motor coordination, cognition, time sense, self-perception, complex tasks, sleep, balance, it creates disjointed thoughts, anxiety, and dizziness. Now, if these were very, very robust, a lot of people wouldn't take marijuana. They're taking it for this reason. But these are the side effects and the consequences. And so on and so forth. So, you can look now at the map that we showed you of marijuana distribution. Now look at a di diagram and see that in this area it can control appetite, hormones. In this area it can control motor function and behavior. In this area the reward, the sensation of reward. In an area that is responsible for anxiety and emotion. It is an area here that's important for vomiting and sensation of pain, for higher function and integrating sensory input. It's important here for learning and memory, the hippocampus and the cerebellum, which is a center for motor control and coordination, and quite frankly, probably a lot more. And this is one of the areas that grows most rapidly during adolescence. So if one smokes THC, um, there's a, a wonderful investigator at Yale University named Souza, and he has done fantastic work over the past um, six to ten years on uncovering the long-term and the short-term effects of marijuana. So in terms of trying to remember a series of words, 
no marijuana, increasing doses, just not, certainly nowhere nearly as good as just the simple uh, placebo. Different tests of memory, you can see there's, there's obviously deficits in the ability of a person to learn and to remember things in a lab setting, but we know that it's true in other areas as well. Let's shift on to marijuana in adolescence. Many of the things that we find in marijuana in adolescence is true for adults as well. The only difference is that the prevalence and the risks are higher for the adolescent than the adult. Increased susceptibility to psychosis, the risk of addiction to marijuana and other drugs, and effects on performance, on cognition. Marijuana smokers who started smoking before the age of 15 performed significantly worse on tests of brain function, requiring executive function, which means planning and ordering, compared with marijuana smokers who started using later on. The early onset users exhibited greater impairment than older ones. And the chronic marijuana smokers had more errors on performance, made worse by earlier age of onset. So impaired verbal IQ, memory of word lists, they made errors of commission, word association, perseveration. What are some of the possible explanations? People who are attracted to marijuana have lower innate cog cognitive capacity, they fail to acquire good verbal skills because they are limited in their education, they're less motivated to pursue education, or their neurotoxic effects of the drug. As marijuana changes, it changes the structure of the adolescent brain. It changes it. So, I won't read all of this. The evidence is there. You'll be able to acquire it on the slides but it's a vulnerable period for producing long-term cognitive deficits in learning and memory. Functional imaging studies showed altered brain response cannabis, um, patterns among cannabis, and on and on. Most imaging studies in adolescents show changes in working memory and attentional deficits. The hippocampus that I showed you, the key area for learning and memory, THC, the active ingredient of marijuana, affects information processing in the hippocampus. We've already seen that it impairs memory. Exposure in utero may result in learning and memory deficits after birth and during adolescence. Exposure during adolescence may result in impaired cognition in adulthood associated with functional changes in the hippocampus. And aging results in nerve cell loss in this critical area for learning and memory. And chronic marijuana hastens age-related losses of these cells involved in learning and memory. That's cognition. What about addiction? Marijuana use at 14 or younger, six times higher prevalence of addiction at age 18. And for alcohol, it's five times higher. It is imperative to protect the adolescent brain from these drugs. Marijuana use and psychosis. What is the evidence? Its use is associated with an increased risk of psychosis. This has been done in a number of studies. And the first one was in Sweden with military uh, men who were followed for a, in a longitudinal study. And then a number of other countries did if there's no risk, the risk ratio is one, and for each of the countries, there was an elevated risk for developing psychosis. And the length of marijuana use, less than three years, four to five, greater than six years, psychosis, hallucinations, and delusions increase as a function of exposure to the drug. What about the adolescent? A high proportion of adolescents who use marijuana or alcohol 
and another drug before the age of 8, 15 or in treatment for addiction. And they may not be in treatment for marijuana addiction, but for addiction to other drugs. This is so interesting. In terms of treatment data sets, this is from SAMHSA, Treatment Episode Data Set, the people in treatment for marijuana who are adults are about 16% with alcohol and another drug, alcohol only taking the lion's share. For kids between the age of 12 and 17, the vast majority, two to one ratio, are in for marijuana addiction treatment, two to one compared to alcohol. The percent of adults over age 26 who use cocaine if they started using marijuana at age 14, they use cocaine much more frequently than if they never used marijuana. And so you say to yourself, is this the child, the environment, the genetics, the psychiatric problems, the learning problems, or is it the drug? And so, a good friend of mine who did this right here at the Karolinska Institute, Yasmin Hurd. And the reason uh, it's so exciting is that last week I received brains from, upon request, from, she did a whole study for me, and we're going to do the analysis of adolescents treated with um, THC uh, to, to look at the hypothesis we'll discuss in a few moments. But what Yasmin Hurd and Maria Elgren, who did her PhD with her, found is that adolescent rats exposed to THC when they were allowed to grow up were heroin-seeking at a much higher rate than adult rats who were exposed to the same amount of THC. What does that mean? It means that if you're exposed to THC during that vulnerable period, you would have a higher propensity to like and to seek heroin. And that's been shown for other drugs as well. So it is the brain. The brain is a piece of this. It is not just these confounding factors. It is the developing adolescent brain that is susceptible to the influence of the drugs. We now know there's a marijuana addiction profile. Progression can be as rapid to chronic use as nicotine. It's more rapid than alcohol in certain populations. And after treatment, only 15% remain abstinent after six to 12 months. And the withdrawal sy syndrome is just can be just as robust as cocaine, depending on how much exposure there was. All these symptoms, irritability, anxiety, nervousness, that's all very, uh, very common amongst cocaine users who are withdrawn. And what the people who withdraw from marijuana claim, the, the people addicted, is that they have had an improved memory. Within 12 days, and that improved memory seemed to persist for at least a year. So, what about psychosis? If you started at, 18, at, at, at age 15 or younger, you young adults were twice as likely to develop a, a psychosis, four times as likely to have high scores than those who never used, and the findings are not due to individuals acutely intoxicated. Marijuana use during early adolescence has been associated with a fourfold increased risk for schizophrenia. Fourfold. The risk rises with increasing heavy adolescent exposure, and it's estimated that adolescent marijuana use may account for 8 to 14 percent of the cases. These are estimates. But every, there's now 10 papers that have shown the higher risk of adolescents to develop a psychosis. And some of these folks I know from reputation, they are excellent investigators. These are not alarmists. They're excellent investigators. So that's 
that is quite a riveting piece of information, is it not? Is it not? Because of those of you who are familiar with schizophrenia, it is truly a lifelong disease that has tremendous consequences for the individual and for their families. With treatment needs that can range from minimal to heavy invasive treatment and risks for suicide, risks for employment, and so many other associated problems. And there, is a, there appears to be a link between marijuana, genetics, and schizophrenia. I won't get into all the, the detail. It is really important not to claim that marijuana definitely will cause schizophrenia. It's important to say that because most schizophrenic patients do not use marijuana, and most people who use marijuana don't go on to develop schizophrenia. But the fact that there is a causal link could be because the genetic platform and other confounds are critical in, in, this, in, in the development of schizophrenia. Some people may say, well, it's kids who are self-medicating because schizophrenia is going to happen to them and they don't feel right. But once again, I think that it's important to bear in mind that it could be the effects of the drugs on the brain. And what we find in adolescent rats, we now go back again and say, well, let's get rid of all the confounds. What you find is adolescent rats exposed to the active ingredient of marijuana show cognitive deficits in adulthood, memory, working memory deficits, and pre-pulse inhibition with abnormalities which is consistent with schizophrenia. What is pre-pulse inhibition? It sounds like a technical term, but it's quite easy to think about. If I throw an array of information at you, clanging of bells and whistles, and I throw a coat at you, and I drop a tray of food. In the same time that I've asked you to try to solve 2 plus 7 times 35, most people would focus on the 2 times 7, 2 plus 7 times 35, and forget the extraneous information because they are, they are, their brain is, is geared towards filtering out all the extra things. I am standing in this room now and I have many things I can focus on. Lighting, the flowers, the tables, the person up in the computers, each one of you, I've memorized half of your faces from this talk. I look at the dark chairs, I know the window is here, and yet I completely ignore it and I can focus on what I'm doing without, and, and, and I know that all this extraneous material is irrelevant to what our job is, our mission this afternoon. Pre-pulse inhibition in schizophrenia means that this filtering mechanism is quite weak. And exposure of adolescent rats to the active ingredient of marijuana reduces their pre-pulse inhibition so that they simply don't know how to react to a whole load of sensory input. And there are many others. I won't get into this except to say there are many brain imaging studies that have shown that there are changes in the adolescent brain exposed to marijuana. Some of them are controversies. Some of them have small numbers of people. But, and it's not settled yet, but there's a growing sense of evidence that there are brain abnormalities in this. So, what about heavy use and fertility? There is good evidence that marijuana decreases sperm motility, counts, viability, oxygen consumption, circulating testosterone, and in females, irregular ovulation, decreased pituitary hormones, and infants born to mums who smoke are shorter, way less, have smaller head circumferences. There is very good evidence that kids in school who abstain from marijuana do homework more, 
get higher grades, graduate college at double the ranks, engage in less stealing as adults and less drug selling than those who experiment or who are frequent users. So let's just summarize the changes. Marijuana is use is associated with changes in brain structure, activity, gene expression, compromised cognitive function with considerably higher risk for adolescents, pathology in lung compromised cardiovascular function, compromised measures of reproduction, negative long-term educational career achievement. I haven't shown you all this data because this is a postprandial period and you have to it's a soporific period after eating. Uh, addiction with higher prevalence, depression, and increased risk of psychosis, schizophrenia, and other psychiatric symptoms. So, one of the things that we did in our lab, and we're starting with THC just, in fact, these studies just started this week when I left, um, but we've done them with methamphetamine and with MDMA, exposing mice to these drugs. And what we find unequivocally is that, first of all, their motor responses, the adolescent and the adult, are completely different. The adolescent in meth just goes wild. Um, and this is just locomotion, much, much higher rates than the adult. And what we find as well, and this is very complicated, so don't even think about it, but you remember I told you that those proteins that are involved in doing wiring of the adolescent brain that say, go here, turn here, move here, come hither, disappear, don't come near me, because I've got to hook you up to this piece of that, I've got to hook you up to the, to the eyes, I've got to hook you up to your arms, to your bladder, I've got to hook you up to your higher cortical functions. These proteins orchestrate that beautiful wiring diagram, and we find very significant differences in how much of these proteins are made in the adolescent compared with the adult brain. And in fact, the two proteins that wire up the dopamine system, which is by some belief to be the heart of the reward system, are changed very differently in the adolescent and the adult brain. And this is one of the most exciting pieces of evidence that could help shape why the adolescent brain is just different, because its circuitry may be quite different after exposure to drugs. Not only are these things different, but also the receptors for dopamine are changed differently. The adolescent is in pale blue, the adult is in uh, dark blue, but you can see they're quite different in terms of response. So let's summarize. It is imperative to protect young people from drugs. It is imperative for their future and the future of all societies. And we know that drug use is increased in adolescents if parents use, if their parents have low involvement, if they have psychiatric conditions or genetic conditions, peer pressure, poverty, poor school grades, and early aggressive behavior. These are all risk factors that parents should be aware of. And they, there is lower drug use. If parents make strong statements disproving of use, they monitor their children, they set clear limits, they have strong family bonds, they encourage their kids to engage in extracurricular activities, encourage them in academic achievement and self-control. All these are evidence-based. I didn't make them up. These come from extensive studies. And finally, I'd like to conclude with one thought. I started off by saying this exquisite, exquisite organ, three pounds that sits, the only organ besides the spine that is protected by a skull. It gives you a sense of how critical it is for our humanity 
that unlike turtles that protect their entire bodies and so many animals that have shells and vertebrates, the mammal protects its brain with a thick skull because it knows that therein resides the master control of life itself. But in addition to that, the human brain is the repository of our humanity. It is what enables us to compose music and write books and poetry and create magnificent art and administer justice and laws and give to charity and to discover DNA and calculus and computers and medicines and to engage in theater and build rockets and engage in love and philosophy and be able to view exploding galaxies and black holes. This is a defense of our brain and we have to defend it at all costs, especially in the young. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. So that was a, a wonderful uh, talk and uh, inspiration. I want to just pick up a couple of things that uh, Bertha said or, or implication. Uh, in, in our efforts, one of the key uh, issues that we confront uh, is the claim uh, that marijuana use is harmless. That's, that underpins much of the argument about harm reduction. Uh, and I think what you've seen here is a very thoughtful scientific presentation uh, about the uh, very serious negative health consequences of uh, marijuana use. So I think that's really important to fix that in your mind about what Bertha has had to say. Uh, the other point is this, when, when I think about what we're doing here at uh, this third uh, World Forum, uh, I think about the issue of prevention and our focus particularly on youth. Uh, that's what the uh, uh, CRC Article 33 is about, is to focus on youth when we're talking about prevention. And it seems to me that what Bertha has done beyond many of the other great contributions is to get us to narrow our focus and think about young people and the particular vulnerability they have. And, and I would just carry it one step further, and I want to develop this a little bit uh, uh, in my remarks tomorrow, but present it to you to think about uh, as a result of this presentation and related to this, uh, is youth are attracted to drug use by very strong biology. Uh, that is the period of time when uh, these pleasure signals uh, systems are tuned up for very good biological reasons. So there's a, a special uh, attraction of the drugs. It's no accident that all over the world the drug issue is focused on adolescence. There's good biological reasons for that. But the prevention issue has to do with preventing young people. Let's just take for a, a, a mind, under 21. Uh, well, it could be a later age, but just think about that for a moment, from drug use. And then you say, okay, how do you do that? What, what does that mean? And my presentation to you to think about is that that actually is, the adolescent drug use is not so much a failure of adolescence as it is a failure of adult stewardship for adolescents. And so when we're talking about prevention, it's not just a matter of what we're going to tell the kid. It's really engaging the adults to act in an, as adults in stewardship for youth. And so the keys to a youth prevention have to do with adult behavior. And that the, the, the epidemic of youth use relates to an abdication of responsibility by adults across the entire 
spectrum in the community. Parents, teachers, pediatricians, everybody. It's not just one group. And if that's going to turn around, Bertha Madras <laughs> is the key element of that. Because what she shows is how vitally important it is to specifically protect youth in terms of prevention. So you might comment on that and then I want to have questions from the group. Just um, thank you, Bob. That summarizes it beautifully. I think the most important issue to bear in mind is that protecting youth should always begin at home. That's number one. With education of parents who have grown up in many societies and many cultures without a sense of what science is beginning to tell us. Then secondarily, I believe that educating medical professionals is key. Believe it or not, the vast majority of what I told you today is not at all in any medical textbook. It resides in the primary biomedical manuscripts that I have been reading now for 40 years and have accumulated a database which thank heavens for computers <laughs> because in the olden days I can show you pictures of my desks I've downloaded every one of these papers and, and some I've read in great depth and others I have not it's very easy at this point to look at what I call good science or junk science um, but educating medical professionals to engage and part of that is to screen kids and to educate their patients on what drugs can do and their patients' parents on what drugs can do. So that's number two. Number three are policies. And policies, government policies, can have a vast impact on outcomes if they're administered correctly and thoughtfully and without unintended consequences. And finally, every community has to be involved and engaged. And this kind of information, I'm sure it can be modified and modulated, but this kind of information should become the norm, the, the platform. Right now in our society and throughout Europe, in many parts of the world, it is the norm to reject smoking. Why? How did this penetrate the collective conscience of so many people? Because the evidence came out that smoking is malevolent, that people die prematurely, and it's a preventable death. The same is true with drugs. That kind of information has to penetrate our culture and become a normal part of the way we think. Gabriel, you had a comment? Yes, I don't think the speaker's working, is it? Right. Hello. There you go, now you're on. Now we go. Um, there has been two uh, groups of researchers who have um, published more or less compiled research on policy both uh, headed by Tom Baber. One on alcohol policy, called Alcohol No Ordinary Commodity, and the other one on drug policy. And uh, I uh, also talked to Tom Baber about this. And uh, it seems like the uh, volume on alcohol concludes that we know quite a lot about what policy, uh, what policies work and which don't work so well. Uh, but he says, and the group says, that there is not enough research on uh, drug policy, or policies to prevent drug problems. Uh, would you agree that uh, drug policy research is much less developed and there is more need for the conclusions uh, on, in the drug policy area than in the alcohol policy area? Well, I agree with Tom that the alcohol research that underpins policy is much, much more extensive. On the other hand, 
the drugs have caught up very quickly. We have a lot of research and information on cocaine, on methamphetamine, on MDMA, on marijuana, and my feeling is at this point there is sufficient information to begin to shape policy. I don't think we have the final analysis yet. I think we have a much more mature tobacco. The association between tobacco and smoking, many of us think it was the 1950s. It was the 1890s when that came up. The association between cocaine and heroin and addiction was also the 19th century. The association between marijuana and addiction in youth is more than a decade old, with some of the finest researchers doing it. So I don't think that I don't I don't think that we are that primitive in, in terms of our understanding, as Tom may Tom may conclude. And I would also like to have you go ahead. Thank you. I, I'd also like to distinguish about policy, about what's going on with the society as a whole, from what's happening with youth. Because I think that really changes it. And most of the things Tom is talking about are much more general social policies. And one of the things that I think is interesting is there is no organized uh, uh, support for youth using any of these tools. I mean, it, it's very interesting. When you get into a public forum, you're going to have a discussion. It's very hard to find somebody who thinks it's a good idea for youth to use drugs, alcohol, or tobacco included. Yes. And that's different, because you've got an argument about adults, but you don't get so much of an argument about youth. The issue about youth is whether all you do is jawbone, all you do is talk, or whether you act, whether you identify the use and intervene. And there the problems are the same with tobacco and alcohol as they are with drugs that there are a lot of very well-educated people and well-informed people who don't want to do anything about youth using drugs and alcohol and tobacco. Versus, at least from my point of view, active interventions to identify the use of all of those and to intervene to stop them. That's where the line gets drawn and the battles occur. Other questions anybody would like to ask? Oh, thank you yes. very much. Sorry, I had a mic. Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, my question is... I couldn't see you, I apologize. Okay, go ahead. no problem. Uh, my question is, considering the beautiful uh, research work of uh, Madras who just presented to us, and um, her role in the US government, I'm going to wonder where was she when the move for legalization of marijuana in America took so much hold? Because well, I, um, I, I, I can answer that one. <laughs> I was um, not inserted into the battle at an official level until my final few months in office. Because there were other people who were on the front lines. And I went into one state and I presented to the legislative branch and the um, to, to the House and to the Senate in this one state and they waved manuscripts at me saying look here's the evidence that marijuana works and I took the evidence and I said here are 13 reasons why that is junk, junk science and I just listed it and it didn't pass So, my degrees of freedom, if I had them, because very often individuals don't have the clout that a federal official does. But I just finished a debate on medical marijuana in Dartmouth University last week, which is videotaped. And there, it was a very fascinating debate. And I came away feeling quite positive about the, the, the experience. It's not difficult to fight these, the, the, the movement. The problem is they fight with pseudoscience and the only way to push back is with real science. And many scientists and many physicians are not engaged. 
want to just suggest that if well, we can come out from the this world and third forum on against drugs, it's a strong commitment to support us for the three and popularize it. That would be much that would be a very great success because the signals are very confusing for us from the developing countries. Um, support for marijuana legalization and the fight against drugs. So I will suggest that uh, the third forum comes out with very strong statements supporting Article 3 of this Convention on the Rights of the Child, which promotes, uh, which uh, actually present, uh, safeguards the right of the child from abuse, from illicit substances. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Here comes the mic. Is it possible to, uh, with some CSAP money, to get some YouTube um, clips of this? Because we've been seeing these, some of these types of things for 15 years, but you know, kids are very hip to this stuff now. Is there oh, any? Absolutely. And what is fascinating, which I tried to allude to earlier this morning, is how curious kids are, not only about understanding it, but according to people who are doing expert with children, the children are saying, show me the manuscripts, I really believe you, but I want to see, I want to understand the science. That's what's happening now. This is very encouraging to me. But um, I just try, I've just submitted a grant to do that. Well, but are your slides going to be on the WFAD website? Yes, yes. So they'll be on the WFAD website, website uh, for any of you to use in any way you want, you want to use it. But I mean, YouTube is free, and you can get some of your graduate students to yeah. do some fast and upbeat and yeah. just clips and clips like, hey, what is schizophrenia? Guess what? You want to try this? No. I mean, you're just some. Yeah, so no, no, no. So you can get some. But quite frankly, I've costed out how to do it properly. Yes. And I need a graphic artist. I have a, an amazing graphic artist. I need uh, a proper studio. I mean, I've, I've looked into this very carefully. And I'm just hoping that the federal government. <laughs> medical school? But thank you. Because it's, it's, it's dynamic and you explain it with, with such uh, love. Well, there's. The brain is a lovely place to be. <laughs> it's a lovely organ. We're, we're going to have to stop to get you in there, but I just want to say a, a little something about thanking the audience. And then, as some of you may have noticed, I had this, what might be called a panic attack during this presentation. And I was rushing out to the back, and a member of this audience figured out what my problem was. And that was I had lost my camera and thought I had left it in there. And he came rushing up to me and tackled me as I was going out and said, You left it on the table, jerk. It's right up there. And I came back, and I've been so comfortable here ever since. And I want to thank John Crow for identifying my source of panic and solving my problem with no Xanax. Thank you all very much. <laughs>